right. Well, thank you guys for being here. I just want to start and ask if you guys have any particular case questions or cases you wanted to present. I have a question, but I would I would really want you to just to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Okay. Well, go, go ahead. Yeah. I have uh, a run, uh, well, an ultra runner who also is a triathlete. So tons of cycling and running with a little bit of swimming thrown in there who, um, has been dealing with a lot of right pain in the right knee pulled his, uh, right groin area. According to his doctor has issues in his lower back on the right side, really tight hamstrings on both sides, but more prominent in the right side. And I'm, I'm trying to work with his personality, which is he just wants to go, go, go. (laughs) And, um, I also am trying to find the most effective things to help him because stretching really hurts. And, um, it's like hard enough just to get him to, to, to believe in it (laughs) and stick with the process. But I'm also getting frustrated myself because I'm feeling like I'm not really sure if what I'm doing is the most effective method for him. So if that, if this is something you want to address today, that would be great. If you want to table it for another time, that's, that's great too. I I'm just finding myself silently more frustrated than him at times (laughs) because I really want to see him progress. Yeah. Yeah. No, we can definitely take some time and talk about that. Um, so let me just see if I have the full picture and then I'll just reiterate and you can add in if there's something or correct, if there's something, but so ultra runner plus triathlete, uh, right side groin pain. Is that the primary issue? Is that the main complaint or is it right knee? It's so it changes and it's very difficult to get a full picture of the history. Um, cause he doesn't like to complain about anything. But I think the knee is really what's stopping him from doing what he loves to do, which is to run. And when he takes breaks from running, he seems to do better when he's just like on the bike. And when I watch him move, the arch of his right foot is is collapsed and his knee seems to not track properly. He tore his meniscus in that knee years and years ago. And then he also has this message from a lot of the doctors, like just stop doing everything that you love to do and you'll feel fine. And um, so his go-to is just not do anything. Right. And then just jump out there and try to do it all over again. (laughs) So I think the right knee right now is the biggest problem, but there's been times where the hip flexors have hurt more, the back has hurt more. Um, It kind of depends upon what he's doing as far as how he's pushing himself. But I, I specifically want to help him with his alignment and moving as in walking, running, cycling. I think the reason he's doing better, not running, not trail running, but while he's cycling is just simply because he's clipped in on his bike and it's helping him keep his legs tracking properly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But how do I give him Pilates exercises? That are interesting enough that capture what he needs. Yeah. 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 So, um, here's here's an interesting thing you you really talked about just right side right arch right knee right groin right low back yeah so Mm -hmm. and I think part of it is trying to sort of tease out I I go to the foot a lot of times for these things especially if I see that right foot arch issue so Mm -hmm. let's set aside his personality for a minute and think of what might be the ideal and then we could then, so this, this is kind of how I think I would work on is set aside personality. What, what ideally do we need to see happening? Like how, when he gets on the bike, for example, have you watched, have you had a chance to watch him on a bike by any chance? I mean, probably not. Right. No, I've watched him run. Okay. Okay. And what do you see? Any, anything in there that like lights up in your mind? It's really the knee tracking that, and I mean, I usually watch him running from behind him and mm-hmm. I can see the knee moving. Okay. Um, like he's trying to find stability with every step. Okay. Okay. And does he wear any arch supports in his shoes at all? I told him that he should, he used to run with orthotics for whatever reason he stopped using them. And 
Uh, he just started using them again, but, if, but like the personality is I'm going to throw those things in my shoes and then go run five miles. Yeah. After I haven't worn them at all for the last 15 years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's, <laughs> yeah. but at least it's, I mean, I think that's a great place to start, honestly. Yeah. Okay. Is at good. The bottom. And a lot of times, so the low back is interesting in runners because if you're saying he's tight in the hamstrings, how about hip flexors, quads? Do you know how tight? Yeah. Tight. I mean, he's tight everywhere. It's amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, then your ideal is getting alignment and getting him stretched. Cause if I'm thinking hip flexors, so as if so as is tight, what's he going to do when he runs? It's going to keep the bend in the knee and shuffles. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So he's not even passing the leg behind him, probably. Not much. And if he has to, it's not going to come from his hip. It's going to come from his lower back, probably. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, you know, sometimes what's really convincing anyway. Okay. Wait, sorry. I'm getting off track here. If you, so I think you're on the right track, fix the arch of the foot, help the knee track, um, checking up higher in the chain, looking at that hip motion. So what happens if he stands on one leg? Um, can he stand on one leg and get all his weight over that right side properly? Or is the hip out to the side? You know, kind of what does that look like? And then what I do is I try and throw a few tests their way that they'll fail, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I want to prove to them that they're failing. So mm -hmm. one of the great ones is a single leg hop test which for runners, what I usually do is put them up on a box, like on the long box standing on the floor and have them jump off of it. First on two feet and I video it while they do it. I video mm -hmm. them jumping down. And so on two feet, he might be able to pull it off, right? Without, with his knees tracking properly, right? So you're looking at that knee tracking and the foot collapsing or not collapsing. Mm -hmm. So ideally they jump off, the, he jumps off the box and you video it and you watch in slow motion. You can slow down the video and just kind of do a slow motion take and watch what happens. Do his knees track right when he's jumping off. It's a really great way to see if, if it is, if that looks good, then I get him back on the box and I have him hop off on one leg because running is hopping from one leg to the other. So right. if you see, and chances are that knee tracking thing is going to happen jumping off the box you have it on video and then you can go, Hey, look right here. That's the problem. So they start to see really, Oh, wow. Look at that right knee. My left knee doesn't do that, but my right knee, look at that. You're right. There's something wrong here. So mm -hmm. then, you know, once they see that, and that could be sort of your test retest or something every time, you know, every few weeks you just come back to that. Okay. Let's try the hop thing again and we'll video it and let's look at it and see if it's getting any better. But that could be kind of your golden nugget, you know, having a golden nugget where they see I failed at that test because that's what they're doing. Athletes like that are always testing themselves. What's the next thing I can get to? How can I get there? You know, how much can I push myself? But if you take something simple, like, can you jump off a box and keep your knee in good alignment? And they realize that they can't, then they're going to take that on too. And so hopefully so, so then you can work towards getting that knee alignment, right? And, and then you can say your knee's not aligning right because you're too tight and your knee's not going to align right when it passes behind you because you're too tight. You can't pass the leg behind you properly. You're going to find a sneaky way. So we need to get the stretching going, you know, so you could start with one thing that leads you to others that gets you to the goal. So stretching and knee tracking sounds like the main things that need to happen. Yeah. So that could be your golden nugget. And then, and then you do have to keep it interesting. So you can't have them sitting there grabbing a ball with their toes for an hour, <laughs> <You know? laughs> because they'll get bored in like two seconds. Somebody's got noise happening. Oh, that's not oh, interesting. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what that was. Um, so and then and this is where I take them to the hard exercises and things that I know they're going to fail at, like um, taking them into big exercises like tendon stretch or up stretch, you pull or hip lift on the chair 
I do a lot of work on the chair and with them having them even balance on single foot on the foot bar of the chair while they're well it's static even yeah those are hard things and I and I've had ultra runners who can't even balance on that thing on two feet and, and, and things that they fail at motivates them to try and do better mm-hmm. so you can the tendon stretch is going to stretch the hamstrings right they can't yeah. do it they can't get their hamstrings on stretch um up stretch you pull that's all hamstring stretching right so letting them do it and letting them not do it well enough but keeping them safe will mm-hmm. challenge challenge those people to the yeah. next level. yeah and, and i was going to add scooter scooter, scooter. particularly hands off when you take your hands off the balancing piece just throws so many people that think they're really strong i love that you said that because that's one of our go-to's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Scooter. Um, so, I mean, I think, and then for the stretching, when the stretching hurts, what I usually do is try active stretching, right? Not passive stretching. So things that will force them to stretch like elephant series or plank series where they have to go through that hips up downward doggy elephant position. So they're moving through the stretch rather than having to lay there holding a stretch that feels really uncomfortable. Right. And then even moving stretches, like if they were going to, if he was going to do a hamstring stretch, instead of having him lay on the back with the strap and have the leg up, have him bending and straightening and bending mm-hmm. and trying, trying to straighten, you know, but keeping it moving in and out of that discomfort slowly, but keeping them and keeping them at that edge of challenge uh, really can help rather than having to be still. If they have to focus on a, a this is a ch- another challenge for me, and I'm going to try and get to this challenge. You're going to get a lot more out of out of them, right? I think. Thank you so much. Yeah, is that, I hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, I, I've been. That's very helpful, and I, some of the things that you said really helped me think about how to tailor it more towards. Uh, like the ultra runner personality um, and some of the stuff we're doing, I, I guess, and we do more dynamic stretches and static uh, for a variety of reasons. Do I need to worry about somebody who's so bound um, causing, causing any repercussive problems? Yeah. I mean, so nothing, I mean, dynamic in slow motion is what I would say. So mm-hmm. that I um, I don't like the really fast, dy- he's fast dynamic stretching himself all the time in, in a shortened range of motion, right? So ultimately like runners and, um, and actually this is interesting because I was about to bring up, this is the next case coming up is the hamstring tearing with runners is a big problem, right? Because especially in women in their 50s, is what are 40s, 50s, I would say, um, because the tissues get less elastic over time, but you still need that range, but you want to have that range. Um, So it's usually if you trip or misstep or do a push off or something that it starts to tear. So you do need dynamic stretching for that if that's the range of motion that you need to use in your activity but it sounds like what he's done is shorten the range of everything Mm -hmm. so that he doesn't necessarily need that extra range that we need him to have for to be more and more efficient and proficient with these sports so um and this is something um the other the other thing you could do is have him read a book (laughs) and there's i the it's Tony Robbins. I can send you the link. So there's this guy. Um, I forget his name. I will find you the book. But he is a military um, SEAL. I don't know if you've seen Kim, maybe you've seen this book. And he decides that he's going to train himself to run ultra marathons. And he just goes, um, It's he's crazy. David, David, it's coming back to me. Is it the leopard book? Leopard um, something? No, that's the supple leopard you're thinking of, but oh. um, that's a good one too. But I, I think that would be a good, there's this book called supple leopard that Kim's referring to that t- is um, 
a physical therapist wrote it, but he's a like a weightlifter, total athlete, and he goes through kind of all what people do generally in weightlifting, um, takes it apart and actually teaches them how to stretch. And it's coming from a super athlete to another super athlete, so it's helpful for them. Um, and But he really pushes the stretching aspect that you absolutely need to stretch. So it might be a good reference. Um, and I'll, I can send you guys this link, the supple leopard. But then this other guy, David, gee, it's coming to me. I'll remember his full name for you. But he um, ends up, Goggins, David Goggins, he ends up um, training himself so hard to run the bad dog race, which is the desert to mountain to Mount Whitney, right? So it's, you run through, it's, I think 140 miles or something run through the desert and up to the base of Mount Whitney. And they run it in the summer when it's like 110 degrees in the desert, right? And the race actually used to go up to the top of Mount Whitney, but now they don't, they stop it at the base because I think too many people were passing out and problems, <laughs> problems and altitude and all of that. Um, but he comes to a point with all his training and craziness that he gets so dysfunctionally sick, um, physically ill. He cannot move. He can't get out of bed. And he realized that the reason he couldn't was because he didn't stretch. And so he put himself on a program, this extreme guy, right? I think it was like a six week stretching intensive program and all his pain and all his problems started to go away. And so it's an interesting book. So um, I'll send you the links for both the supple leopard and for that, because if you have problems motivating people to read from somebody else who's been there, done that, and who realized, comes to this realization that I can't get along without the stretching and that it's really going to ruin my ability to perform, then they start to get motivated to perform better than coming from a me, like a Pilates instructor who likes to do sports, but I'm just a, like, I'm not an ultra runner. Why should they listen to me? But if they hear it from another ultra runner, but David Goggins, uh, maybe look him, I listened, I did an audio book, listened to his book. And then he's actually, somebody else wrote a book because he trained another person to do what he's doing. And he talks about how it's the mental game and how, but that, but he gets dead stopped because he wasn't stretching. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll send you those resources. Um, and hopefully then, but that, back to the dynamic stretching. So you need the dynamic stretch, but only, only for the range of motion that you're going to be using in your activity. He, what he really needs is a fascial length, lengthening, right? So that takes time. It really does take time in stretch, but somebody that's an ultra athlete isn't going to sit there and stretch for five minutes because they just don't have that kind of patience, I don't think. So that's why slowly bending, extending, bending, extending to the, to the edge of pain so that it's challenging. Mm -hmm. They feel a challenge. It's painful. It's hard for me to do this and give them solid goals. Like, I know this is hard for you, but I want you to have the leg reach, you know, this angle, you know, this by two weeks from now, this leg's got to get to this angle. So, and then let, let them work it out. Let him work it out how he's going to get there and how much pain he's going to get to. And I go, you're not meeting your goals. You got to work harder. You know, that's the sort of push that somebody like that needs, I think. Super helpful. <laughs> and I'll send you those links because if it's not enough coming from you, say, hey, look, I've got this great book for you. I want you to listen to, or here's a great book reference that, that I think will really help you in your efficiency and speed. And all of that is attached to stretching. It's all really attached. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna write myself a note so I don't forget to send you this stuff. Okay, so yeah, we have, um, this is a 65 year old comes in after her second car accident within a year is what I should say in a year's time in both car accidents she was hit from behind and ended up with a whiplash type injury her initial complaints after the second accident were pain in the upper shoulders and neck pain with moving the head and then also pain at night six months later she's recovered from the initial trauma but it's left with residual symptoms her main complaints are pain with lying on her couch 
pain with driving more than 30 minutes and pain after working at her computer. She's a kindergarten grade, a kindergarten teacher and spends much of her time working with students at their desks. Her symptoms were much better in the summer when she was not working, but now they have traveled into her right hand and she gets a radiating type pain from her elbow down to the hand. When you look at her posture, you realize that she seems to have very little curvature in the cervical region and her spinal curves are small, so we kind of a flatter spine. She's slightly posterior tilted at the pelvis and standing. Her right shoulder slopes down slightly and she's right-handed. She continues to worsen with driving, sitting on her couch and working at her computer. So I wanted to share this with you because this one, like last week's, is a little bit um, more complex because uh, it's it seemed to start with one thing and finish with something or become something that it wasn't poten potentially wasn't initially that other thing. So here, um, you know, what question, go ahead, what questions do you have after reading this? I'll give you a minute to look it over again and then just shoot your questions out. One of my questions would just be when um, you're looking at this, uh, it says very little curvature of her mm -hmm. cervical region. Mm -hmm. If there's anything, if, if it's been that way forever or if it's been changing over time, um, just to get a baseline for what her norm was pre yeah. pre trauma. Yeah. Good. It wouldn't necessarily, good. Sorry, go ahead. Something else. I was just going to say it wouldn't necessarily change uh, treatment, but just to get a better, a more holistic picture of her body. Mm -hmm. So the unfortunate thing is I never got to see her before the first accident. Mm. So I don't know. Um, but if I, if, She's somebody that if you looked at her neck, there's really not much curvature in her neck at all. And that is typical after cervical trauma. So whiplash injuries are a big one in that. So what usually happens with cervical trauma is the neck sort of straightens and ends up a little bit slanted forward in the, instead of curving into its usual curvature or the lordosis. The lordosis sort of straightens out a bit. Um, so I didn't get to see her before the first accident, but she was already, uh, it didn't really change much from the first to the second accident. I wouldn't say there was a noticeable straightening between the first and second accident, which I saw her after the first and then again, after, or still and again after the second. So, um, so I don't know, but her thoracic, all her curves are small. Like there isn't a lot of curvature in her spine. She's pretty Flat, there's not a huge thoracic, the cervical is a little bit slanted forward and straightened, and there's not a lot of lumbar, and that's that posterior pelvis posture, right, that she's, that she's always had, sort of that posterior pelvis positioning, um, that was her whole life. Shoulders, are the shoulders forward at all? Slightly know, forward, yeah, not then, not that like you look at it and go, yikes, those shoulders, yeah, right. And the neck, the neck is, I would say, more than the shoulder, but her head is not like falling off her body. Yeah, it's just that it's a little forward, you know. So she's more kind of one of these, a little bit forward, a little bit round, kind of a little concave chested, um, but not like you know the turtle. Um, and no hump, really. I mean, she has a little bit at that T1, um, but nothing like huge lumpy there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just all pretty flat. Well, I wouldn't try to diagnose because I'm not right. a diagnostician. No. <laughs> so I would um, try opening up the chest and taking a uh, TheraBand and starting with some rowing and seeing and standing posture if possible to see if we can kind of unkink something a little bit. That's what I, what I would start with, rowing, lap series, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a great place to start. I would, um, I would definitely get her on the roller. I would definitely mm -hmm. be opening up the chest. I would definitely be, so when you say rowing back, that's to strengthen the upper back, which is 
opens the chest and strengthens the upper back to stabilize. So that's why that's a good, great key. Um, mm -hmm. What what do you think though? So the reason this one was interesting because was beca is because we have a lot of clients that come in with neck pain. So her initial complaint wasn't anything about the right arm. So if you now picture upper trap and neck tightness over time, is there something and then and then later developing tingling in the arm, right? Is there something that comes into mind that you should be aware of potentially? So if, if after the accident you're thinking, well, what are you thinking? A after reading this, what comes into mind? What do you have to be careful of after before the tingling comes on, what are you thinking? I mean, I'm thinking there's possibly a nerve entrapment somewhere. Um, After the, for the hand stuff? Yeah. So yeah. I'd want to be careful about doing, you know, lifting, that kind of thing, just to see mm -hmm. where you go, where I go with the rowing and the roller first. So initially, right, you're thinking what? Neck, right? Whiplash neck, right? Mm -hmm. So then say that that's getting better. And then she has the second accident. And even that, there's no tingling at first. And then later on, that starts happening. But her primary complaint, right, is upper shoulders and neck pain. So... Um, what, what could you start thinking might be going wrong? Nerve impingement is on the right track. Absolutely. Because that could definitely be something that is go going down, triggering into her hand, but where is that nerve impingement potentially happening? In the cervical spine. Yeah. Cervical is one option. What's the well, other? My, option? It could be, it could be, um, cervical or thoracic. However, when you're hit from behind, when you're rear-ended, right? Because this happened to me and I was pregnant, actually. Normally, if you see it coming, you'll hit your brake, right? So people think you go forward. You don't go forward. You go back and forward, right? So what happens is there actually could become a shift in the pelvis and then the unleveling because I had that for quite a while. So I just wouldn't even look at it from the top down. I'd look at it from the bottom up. So she had two accidents where she was rear-ended. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So... And now let's take in her work. You said she was better when she wasn't working. All day she's here. She's working with kids. She's in flexion. She has very little curvatures in her spine, you're saying. So you're not saying she's kyphotic or you're just saying her curves are small. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. But she's not kyphotic in any way. Not fixed kyphosis, no. Okay. And she's not, she's not hyperlordotic or... Uh, she's not, you said she's slightly in a tuck position. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, right there, when you get hit, hit from the rear, that sends a chain reaction all the way up the spine. I mean, it just does. So when I get numbing, if there's any numbing going down the extremities, I'm going to the spine for that, whether it's upper thoracic or cervical. Right. And that's, and that's fair enough, but there's another option. Okay. So definitely I'd be worried about nerve referring from the spine, from the neck, probably in this case. Um, and because, because of which, where it's going, right? If it was in the thoracic spine, the pain would be in the torso or the nerve referral would be more in the torso. If it's in the cervical spine, referral patterns are down the hands, into the hands. So cervical refers out to the hands. So that would be a good option that it's a nerve from the cervical spine, but what if I told you it wasn't? What is another thing that could be going on that's causing the nerve to get upset into her arm? Oh, well, sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, is the nerve, is it numbing or is it fire? You know what I mean? Because there's a difference. If it's just pain or is it numbing in the extremities? It's discomfort and numbing both. Okay, she has both, okay. You One know? of the things that comes to mind is, um, well, there are two things. When you're speaking about what's going on in the elbow and the hand, it could be the shoulder as well, related to what's happened in the neck. Um, 
and especially like within the traps. And it sounds like she has worse symptoms driving, sitting on the couch and working on her computer. All of these things require one to sit. So spine is compressed. And then with all of those things, arms are forward in front of you, except for maybe sitting on the couch. So she probably has similar postural positioning with those three activities with the compressed spine and the way that she holds her shoulders and, and head as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I would actually just want to see what she looks like when she's driving. I've like had clients get in their car and show me what their, what the seat arrangement is, what it looks like when they just sit on the couch. I've looked at their setup at work and what does it look like when you're in front of your computer to give some idea of how the body's held to see where we can make some postural changes. So Great. I would look at both the, the whole spinal column, but then also specifically look at the shoulder as well. Exactly. Okay. Great. You guys are right on track. So here's how she looks when she's on her computer driving and sitting on her couch. Hmm. What's going on in this area? Yeah. Do you know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't know. So when you're in that position, there's the clavicles actually rotate the thoracic outlet. It goes underneath the clavicle down the arm. The, so if, what? Say that again. The what? Sorry. Say it uh, again. The thoracic what? So the clavicles, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the clavicle, name of can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So the clavicles actually, they rotate slightly from this point, right? So if you're in a downturn position, the thoracic outlet, which hey, stop, is the stop, bundle. Perfect. Goes, stop, stop. Perfect. Okay. What is, she just said the thoracic outlet. Do you guys know what the thoracic outlet is? What thoracic outlet is? Kim Naya. So, okay. Here in the front of the neck, do you want to explain it, Erin? Or shall oh, I? Please do. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. So the thoracic outlet is the area where the nerves come out from your neck into your brachial plexus, which is your nerve plexus into your arm. And the, way, the pattern of travel, the pathway, is from your cervical neck, underneath your anterior scalenes right here in your neck, under the clavicle, under the pec minor specifically, and under your armpit. And that's the, the bundle of nerves. So you've heard that people say you should never pick somebody up from under their arm. It's because the nerve bundle for your arm is resides there. And so they don't wanna cause any issue there. So the other option of place where there's pressure, shoulder we mentioned, we mentioned cervical. The other place is somewhere along this chain in the thoracic outlet. And for somebody who's up like this and up in the shoulders here and uh, forward here, closing down the pecs are tight. And the other interesting thing is you can, you can feel this on yourself, right? Your first rib, we, if you push down into your um, shoulders here, right near your neck, you'll feel a hard thing that's probably pretty sensitive to touch. And that's, so I'd go closer to your neck, Kim. Yep. And then a little further to the back. Yep. And then just follow the sides and back of your neck right to the top of your shoulder there. And it feels really hard. I don't know, mine are pretty prominent, <laughs> so it feels pretty hard. And what that is, people go, oh, you're so tight. That's such a tight muscle. Actually, no, that's your first rib. So your, your first rib gets, can get pulled up by your upper traps. And if the first rib comes up, it actually makes the thoracic outlet even smaller. So somebody who's posturing like this and forward, Erin, you're right on track, right? That's could be shutting down the space in this area, which we call the thoracic outlet. And then Aaron, take it from there. Where does that, what happens then? The symptoms are, oh, sorry, Aaron, we can't hear you one more time. The way I understand it. So that's interesting, the first rib, because if people have an injury, the rib can get flared, but sometimes people get the rib turned down or no, or up, you know, and they breathe and it hurts. So the first rib, I know people don't realize it's way up here. Mm -hmm. And so when, when that happens and it impinges, it's kind of like it's battening down on the outlet, right? The clavicles. I mean, Hendrickson teaches us how to like kind of release this here. 
-hmm. So it comes through. And so when that happens, um, I have people do this a lot on the reformer, um, on, on mermaid, they're on the bar and I have them do this and really flex their hands. And they're like, Whoa, and they feel it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's your thoracic outlet, right? you you want to, that should be open. So then you get impingement. It's coming from the cervicals. That's the thoracic outlet comes from the cervical. So then you can get a numbing or pain and, and then the myotomes address, you know, at what part of the arm you're getting that. I don't know if that's right, but yeah. So you have to. Very close. Yeah. So the, I just, that's very close. Yeah. So um, the thoracic, right. The th cervical nerves, it's different than the thoracic outlet because what we're trying to do is trace where the source of the pain is and name it for that. So it is the cervical nerves that pass through the thoracic outlet. When we call, when we say somebody has a thoracic outlet syndrome though, we're talking about problems in the thoracic outlet area. Otherwise we'll, we'll call it a cervical nerve impingement issue or a cervical nerve pain so that we can differentiate. It's kind of like differentiating sciatica from a lumbar nerve impingement, right? right. The, sim, very similar. So this would be our sciatica for the upper body potentially and then the reason that going into that sort of position stretches it all out especially for these three is because that's putting the median nerve which is one of the nerves that comes out of the thoracic outlet on stretch which relates to the lower cervical or kind of mid lower cervical right so when you take the arm and you stretch it all the way away and you're opening the chest and stretching the wrist down and then you could actually tilt the head away, most people can get some nerve tension. So you're getting some I get nerve tension since my head goes away here. I use my arms a lot though. Um, so if you can feel that, it's a really nice test to feel it. Um, and then you can have them sort of stretch in and out of that to create that nerve tension test. Specifically though, for the thoracic outlet, it's that pec minor it's lowering the first rib, right? And so um, opening the chest, which is where you started, Kim, was back on that roller, opening the chest and working to strengthen is really the right path and the right route. So you had it from the very beginning, you knew what to do right away, you're right on target. Um, and then the only difference here is that somebody with a thoracic outlet versus just a cervical issue, is gonna easily, could potentially be easily flared up. So sitting at the couch flares her up just because she's already flared. I think of the three things, the computer, the driving and the sitting on the couch, the sitting on the couch is gonna be the easiest to resolve. But to Erin's earlier point, right? She's probably sitting in that posterior tilt which is gonna hollow everything here and then let the head fall a little bit forward, right? And that hollow here is bad for our thoracic outlet space, right? So it's probably just that positioning that's feeding into her. And, th and the truth is she tells me that the only time I sit on the couch is at the end of the day when her husband wants to watch TV at the end of the day. And I said, you know, lay on your roller while in front of the, on the floor in front <laughs> while he's sitting on the couch, you can still be together and um, you can be open in this position that we want you in. Um, so the only the only thing, though, to be careful of is somebody with thoracic outlet can be quite severe and symptomatically can be getting worse. And it's going to get uh, if we overstretch them while they're in this flared state, they'll actually get worse and not better because it's just too much pressure. Anytime you stretch the pec minor specifically, it's going to put pressure on that thoracic outlet area, put pressure on the nerve here in the chest. So you may need to temper how much stretching you're doing. And you can you also want to, like you said, Kim, avoid really overhead. The other thing I didn't write in here, but she wanted to do an exercise class. And, but in the exercise class, they were doing a lot of overhead kind of arm punches and weights and stuff, and stuff in front. That made everything so much worse because she can't get, even with cervical, I don't do overhead usually because the form is really hard. But thoracic outlet specifically, I wouldn't be doing arms up, and especially in front like this. That's just going to put pressure right where she's already has too much pressure. So we took those exercises out, had her do everything down here and, and back. So rowing, elbows back. That's right. So strengthening the upper back to open the front of the chest. 
Yeah. What questions do you have or maybe just a comment because so you know i've been told i have a reverse curve in my cervical spine right so i'm 56 now and now i did get one epidural right one time because it got so bad right like i couldn't move anyway at night so right now it's flaring up a little so it's literally like i have to get myself in bed and just if it starts hurting i'll get numbing these fingers are all going numb it's a matter of me just up oh, I have to literally find it and it will let off. Now, I, I believe that's more my cervical, right? And it's painful, but I'm just saying I kind of really get this because I, I don't know that it's this, but my point is, is I really get what that pain is like. It can be, it's nerve pain. It's unbelievably painful. And then there's numbing as well, depending on where it's coming from. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I'm just saying, I kind of understand that, what it feels like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting if we start talking about numbing and stuff in the hands, uh, it can be a number of other things too, right? So it could be that there's an impingement happening at the elbow. Uh, there could be an impingement happening in the carpal tunnel, right? Um, so all these things have to be ruled out going up the chain. They ruled out, in her case, they ruled it out. And her doctor, not every doctor will actually give the diagnosis of thoracic outlet because sometimes it's kind of one of those rule out diagnoses. If nothing else fits, we'll call it thoracic outlet. Now I think it's become, and for a long time, it wasn't really diagnosed. So now it's becoming more and more recognized uh, um, as an issue of itself. And they're doing MRIs to actually see what's going on in there. And then they can see the impingement in this region somewhere. So um, in her case, they, the question remains: Why did she end? Why did she start without thoracic out outlet and end up with thoracic outlet? So, if, if you can imagine somebody who has, and I've seen this happen multiple times, and multiple times after car accidents, which is really interesting that it turns into something worse. I think thoracic outlet to me is worse than just a whiplash. Right, because it sticks around, it's hard to get over. It can be really debilitating um, as well. So why does it turn into that, do you think? Just, just imagine the posture, right? So imagine hurting your neck or having a client who has a hurt neck. And if you've ever had your neck hurt, I think um, most of us have had some sort of neck hurt at some point. <laughs> but what is it that you do when your neck hurt? move it you lower it move it around lay and, it down <laughs> and you protect it right yeah yeah and, and how do we protect the neck i don't it's know with, i mean close in i think yes and it's with all these yeah. muscles right these all protect so shoulders go upper traps shoulders go up sternocleidomastoid goes oh, yeah. closes down we close down the front of our neck which is a which are those anterior scalenes and we kind of posture ourselves like this to hold our head up, right? So if you've seen somebody who's had neck pain and now she's had two, two hits in a row, so this is a long-term neck pain, right? She was really getting better after that first one. I actually didn't see her for a while. And then she came back in with another one. So uh, she, what I think my, in this particular case, she was holding herself, holding her neck up with her wrong muscles for so long that she ended up with this tension and tightness in the front of her chest, neck and chest that led to the thoracic outlet because that wasn't one of her primary complaints. If, if the accident had caused a cervical injury where there was a disc or a nerve impingement, those symptoms should have come on right away, right? They should have come on with the accident or just after, like a couple of days after she should have had the numbness if we were, if it was because directly because of the accident and the whiplash don't you think i mean that's what i would think so zaina when you say she was already you know she, first of all she's in a postural thing for a while right and um hendrickson says when things atrophy uh they don't they they move towards the midline so whether it's this 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 right that's what happens in in guarding or protecting because no matter what the skeleton is going to try to be ambulatory no matter what right so it's trying its best now she gets hit two times. She's already set up for it. Now she has a blunt force injury from, right, from two accidents. 
So she may not have had it before, but she was set up for it. And then she gets hit. Right. And it, it just it kind of exacerbated all of it. It's like this, it got opened up. Does that make sense? So it just kind of it's compounding situation, really. Yes. So the, the before the first accident, she didn't have neck issues at all. The first accident started it. Then she was getting better, but then she got hit again. And then her protective body went into play, right? And it takes a while to get over with flush from a car accident. Even if you're in good hands and you're doing all the right things and you're really diligent, it just takes time for that healing to take place. And in that process, she continued to work, which her work, her work teaching kindergartners is pretty significant because they're desks are tiny and her, we had to go through how to posture yourself next to a child while you're working with them we got her kneeling pad to carry around her classroom so she could kneel rather than bend over so she would squat down and kneel at the desk side every time instead of because she was leaning over right and leaning over closing down the neck having to go forward was just kind of keeping the symptoms alive so that all helped, but then the computer thing started kicking in. So, and then the hand started kicking in. And so that's when um, she actually didn't go see somebody for a while uh, or, and then finally she did. And the doctor did an MRI and said, oh, it's thoracic outlet. But how did we get from cervical to thoracic outlet? I think I think it's the guarding over time, having to find a alternative way to hold the head up when when the atrophy, when the pain came in and the muscle shut down, I wouldn't even say it was atrophy, immediate atrophy. I think it's just how that we pattern ourselves. The muscles tend to shut down when we uh, are in pain, like, like the transverse abdominis, right? If you hurt your back, that's the first muscle to shut off. It's the same thing. The small muscle stabilizers tend to shut off. And then you have to hold with your big muscles and they fatigue if, if they're constantly on and tighten. And that's, I think, how she ended up with thoracic outlet and it happened to two young younger women even that I worked with years ago. Um, same thing, it was so debilitating that she couldn't go to school anymore. She couldn't get her work done, um, you know, so it can be really bad. But these the reason I thought this was interesting was because it went from a uh, cervical into something more. And it's nice to recognize when something's not quite like yeah, hopefully most of the clients that you see something might happen and you're working with them and they get better and better and better and the trajectory is getting better but when you see the trajectory getting better and then you see a left hand turn and the trajectory starts or new symptoms kick in or the trajectory is starting to go the wrong way getting worse or some things are getting worse that's a big red flag right so that's when you need to reconsider rethink or maybe um decide, send them back to their doctor, you know, decide what needs to happen because that's not what we're hoping for to see in anybody. And they went through the whole, her whole family history. Apparently her mom has some degenerative disc stuff and anybody um, who's lived a life and in their sixties is going to maybe have a little bit of degenerative disc stuff going on. That's pretty common to see some degenerate degeneration of the spine um, so, but her mom apparently has some, and then, um, so they thought maybe it was that. And then finally they said, okay, okay, we'll do some more testing. And that's when they figured out that it was thoracic outlet. So that's a little bit different of a treatment protocol only because you have to be a lot more careful, a lot more gentle with the arm motions than you would necessarily with other things. So, all right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks You're welcome. Dana. Right. You're welcome. Bye. Have a good day. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.